Well, we're in the series called You Ask For It. And uh, I want you to know that we've tried to answer your questions from the survey that you sent in. And one of the questions uh, dealt with things like infant baptism. Uh, what is baptism? What is spiritual formation? What, what's my next step? And so I wanted to answer that question in particular about infant baptism and what is scriptural baptism. So the title of the message today is simply, what does the Bible say about baptism? And this is the key. It really doesn't matter what tradition is. It really doesn't matter what the church has said. The real issue is what does the Bible say? Can I have an amen? And so I want to talk to you about what the Bible says about this subject. So let's pray and we'll just dive in. Father, thank you for all these that you have brought to the house of the Lord today. And I pray the Holy Spirit will be at work at every campus and online. And I pray that the the God, the little G, the God of this world won't be able to blind people from receiving the truth. I'm asking, Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, lead us and guide us into all truth. And I pray that you would anoint the preaching of the word today, that people understand what their next step is, what the Bible says about baptism. And I pray that many would be obedient and many would desire to follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. What does the Bible say about baptism? And I really want to answer that question with four questions. The first one is this, what is baptism? What is baptism? And if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28, and uh, we'll start right there looking at uh, what the Bible says about baptism. Uh, It comes from a Greek word, baptizo, which means to dip. It literally means to immerse or submerge. Baptism is traditionally called a sacrament or an ordinance. It's called a sacrament because it is symbolic. It's called an ordinance uh, because it's an act of obedience, but sacrament and, and uh, uh, it being a, an ornament. Uh, I can get this out. See, I'm the, li- I'm the least likely person to be in choice books. Amen. I mean, come on. God can use anybody if he can use me. And so the ordinance is called that because of an act of obedience, but those are man-made terms. All right, that, those are traditional terms. They're not biblical terms. I'm talking about what does the Bible say about baptism, and I want you to know it's never called a sacrament, never called an ordinance. In fact, some churches sprinkle, or they, they have what they call infant baptism. And so what I would say to you is this, that again, that's nowhere found in the Bible. Nowhere do you see sprinkling as a mode of baptism. Nowhere do you see infants being baptized in the Bible. No, I think the intent behind it is dedicatory. In other words, a parent is really saying to God, I am going to bring this baby up, this child up in the faith. And in doing so, pray that on their own as an adult when they're old enough that they will follow Christ. I want you to write down two scriptures. Now write it down. Luke chapter 2 verse 22 through 40. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. In Luke 2, 22, you see Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, taking him as a baby to be dedicated. All right, that's Luke 2, 22 through 40. Then in Matthew 3, 16 through 17, you see Jesus as an adult being baptized on his own. Not something that Joseph and Mary chose to do. That is the biblical pattern. In fact, that's why I can tell you after studying this week that it was only 300 years after the Bible was completed, 300 years after the New Testament was completed, that the church came up with this idea of infant baptism. Okay? And and so it is not the biblical example. The biblical example is what you see in the life of Jesus. Dedicated as a baby, he was baptized as an adult. And that's why we as a church offer opportunities to do both, to have child dedication and to have believers baptism. Now, in Matthew 28, where I told you to turn, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is Jesus speaking, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus commanded baptism. It's not an option for the church. And it's not an option for a believer, a follower of Christ. And and so I I want you to understand, let me just put it as simply as I know how. If you won't do this simple act, then you're going to have trouble with everything else in the Christian life. 
if you won't do the simple thing that God asks, how are you going to do the hard things? And so we, we see what is baptism. Number two, who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 4. You still awake? Say amen. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. Who should be baptized? Those who repent. And I love it that it says that John preached in the wilderness. Why did he go to the wilderness to preach and to baptize? Because God will meet you where you are. The children of Israel, what's their past? What's their story? God brought them out of Egypt to the wilderness. And in the wilderness for 40 years, he fed them, clothed them, provided for them. And they rebelled against God in the wilderness over and over again. And I want you to know, God sees you and your rebellion. He knows all about your wilderness experience. And he can handle your past. You bring it all to him. Now notice it's called a baptism of repentance. You see it again in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you. Why do we need to repent? Because we've all sinned. How do you know that you're a sinner? Well, God gave us the Ten Commandments and we've broken every one of them. You say, oh preacher, I some of them I didn't break. Hang on. God gave us really two tablets, two, two stones, and on it, it talks about loving God and loving others. Loving God. No other gods. Do you mean every day of your life, every season of your life, God's always been number one in your life? No, I don't think so. No idols. Have you ever made an idol out of stuff? Sports? Yeah, guilty. Career? Work? We, we make idols out of things, don't we? Um, not use God's name in vain. You mean you've never cursed, never used profanity? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? You mean all of your life, every week there's been one day that you cease to work and just focus on worshiping God? No, we broke all of those. Let's go to the next one. Love people. Honor your parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a child, we're to obey our parents. We didn't. As a young adult, we re respect our parents. Uh, as a middle-aged adult, you are supporting or caring for your aging parents. Not murder. You say, finally, preacher, I've got to one that I didn't break. Hang on. Jesus said, if you ever hated anyone in your heart, if you ever been angry at your brother, mm. then it says, not commit adultery. Oh, there's the one I didn't do. Listen. Jesus said, if you look at another person and lust after them, you've committed adultery in your heart. Pornography. You ever looked at someone? You ever looked back the second time? Don't look at me spiritual. <laughs> We've broken every one of them. Not steal. You ever cheated on a test? Ever stole somebody else's idea? Ever um, purchased something but failed to make payment on it? H have you ever... Uh, not handle somebody else's property correctly. When, when people go in and loot stores and steal, listen, that's somebody else's property. And if you have not treated somebody else's property well, that's stealing. Not lying. You ever told a white lie? Ever told a half truth? Not covet. Have you ever been jealous or envious of anybody? Every one of us have broken all Ten Commandments. But listen, the commandments were never meant to save us. They were meant to show us our need for a Savior. What I would tell you is this. God knew we couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. He wasn't trying to save us through keeping the Ten Commandments. Old and New Testament. See, some people say, well, the Old Testament, they were saved by law. New Testament, were saved by grace. No, 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 no. I'm telling you. You read, Abraham believed God and it was accounted, credited to him as righteousness. It is belief. It is repentance. It is faith. Read the men and women in Hebrews chapter 11. Every one of them saved by faith, by faith, by faith. And so God's plan of salvation has never changed. The reason he gave us Ten Commandments is to show us our need for faith, our need for him. You see, the law reveals God's righteousness, but it can't make you righteous. The law shows you you need a Savior, but it can't save you. The law uh, will tell you that you're spiritually dead, but cannot make you spiritually alive. James says the law is a mirror. What does a mirror do? You look in the mirror and you say, oh yeah, I need, to, I need to clean up here and clean up here. The mirror just reveals where you need cleaning. The mirror is powerless to clean you. That's why you need Jesus. 
Are y'all tracking with me? And both of these love God and love people. Jesus summed all ten up in, that, in those two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So here it is. John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, comma, you'll keep my commandments. Now, if you focus on, I got to keep the commandments, 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 you're going to be miserable. You can't do it. But if you'll just focus on loving Jesus, Jesus will enable you to keep the commandments. It's like my wife. I've, I've used this illustration before. I'm faithful to her not because there's a commandment that says do not commit adultery. I'm faithful to her because I love her. And if I love her, I'm not going to commit adultery. Are you tracking with me? So which side of the comma are you living on? Yet it's important that you understand your need for God and then you put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Who needs to be baptized? Those who repent. I've shown you all the things we need to repent of. All right? But also the Bible ties it to believe. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. Acts 8, chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were, everybody say it, they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 18, 8. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So here it is. Who should be baptized? Those who repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repentance and belief comes before baptism. If you've got it, say amen. So I know a lot of people. You were baptized as a baby, christened as a child. And it was meaningful to your parents, but it meant nothing to you. You don't even remember it. Scriptural baptism, I'm, I'm answering the question, what does the Bible say about baptism? Scriptural baptism is after you repent and believe, and it's your decision. Number three, why should you be baptized? Why should you be baptized? Well, first of all, to follow the example of Jesus. Write that down. To follow the example of Jesus in Matthew 3, 17 when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And I want you to know that, you know, the first thought that probably goes through your mind is, Well, what will people think? It doesn't matter what people think. What matters is what God thinks. And God says, What? That's my son. That's my daughter. And whom I am well pleased. It, the focus ought to be on following the example of Jesus and pleasing God. And I want you to know that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Jesus was baptized not because he had anything to repent of. He was sinless. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He was baptized to identify with us in our sin. And you ought to be baptized to identify with him. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4, it says, he who says, I know him, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but does not keep his commandment. First thing he commands is to be baptized. So you go around saying, I'm a Christian, but you hadn't had scriptural baptism. This is what the Bible says. I didn't write it. Don't get mad at me. I'm just deli I'm the delivery boy. The Bible says you're a liar. The truth's not in you. If you claim to be a Christian and won't do what he has commanded you to do. I like to explain it like this. That, that baptism is the wedding ring of the Christian life, all right? Uh, Tammy gave me this ring when we renewed our vows. I don't have the first ring she gave me because I couldn't even get it on my pinky. Anybody, can I get a witness? I mean, all right, I was a lot skinnier then. She gave me this one when we renewed our vows. It has a stone for every child that God gave us. It has four stones for the children we have here on earth and one for the child we have in heaven. It's meaningful to me. The ring doesn't make me married. It just lets me, everybody know I am married. All right? Y'all not getting it. The ring says I belong to her. You can't have this. <laughs> and what baptism is, is the ring, the wedding band of the Christian life. You're saying... Devil, you can't have this. I belong to Jesus. Amen? Now, can you imagine, because at a wedding, and I've done so many of them in 40 years, who, you know, we seal the vows with the ring. Could I have the ring, please? Can you imagine a guy taking the ring and going to put it on her finger, and she's like, I really don't want that. 
let's just skip this part and, and say, you know, I don't want to be 100% committed to you anyway. About 75% is all I'm going to do. 25% of the time, I'm going to see other people. We're going to have an open marriage. You just said, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back. <laughs> and I'm telling you, God didn't want 75% of the commitment. He wants all of you all the time. And, and so we do this to follow the example of Jesus. Here's another reason why, to mark a changed life. I love this verse in Romans 6, 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. It's a picture of his death and resurrection. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And so here it is. It marks... The end of an old life and the beginning of a new life. Now listen. We're talking about what does the Bible say about baptism. If your baptism, whenever it took place, did not mark the end of an old life and the beginning of a new life, if it wasn't marked by repentance and belief, it wasn't scriptural baptism. Okay? So why should you do it? To follow the example of Jesus, to mark a changed life. And then here's the third reason. To declare Christ publicly. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Even though you don't say anything, when you just get in the water, you're saying, I'm not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You belong to him. I have seen senior adults call this church from a nursing home and say, I want to be baptized, and we do it. I have seen uh, a senior adult lady come down on a walker, and she had a little portable oxygen tank. And I'm telling you, she took that oxygen off for a few minutes, got in that water, was baptized, got out, put that oxygen back on, and went out with her walker. If there's a will, there's a way. I saw an 86-year-old lady come from one of our campuses and was baptized by the campus pastor during the week, And uh, it was the neatest thing. 80, I think she was 86. She said, it's the best decision I ever made. There was a 90-year-old member. uh, uh, and She was on hospice, okay? On hospice and, and dying. Blind, but she wanted to be baptized. Her children were members of our church. And we literally, she couldn't get out of the bed. She's on hospice. We literally went to her house. She had a huge garden tub, and we took these sheets that she was, you know, laying on, and we had four people, one on each corner. We picked her up in that sheet. We lowered her down in the water and brought her back up. It's one of the sweetest baptisms I've ever seen. I'm just telling you, if they can do it, you can do it. If if there's a will, there's a way. And and so... uh, The last thing is just when should you be baptized? We've talked about what is baptism, I've told you. Who can be baptized? Those who repent and believe. We've talked about why and now when. Look at what the Bible says in every example without exception. Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, repent, let every one of you be baptized. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Everybody say these two words. Everybody say it. Everybody say it. Every campus. That day, 3,000 souls were added. It doesn't say 3,000 had to go to confirmation class. It doesn't say that 3,000 had to go to a discipleship class. It didn't say that 3,000 had to go home and talk to their families first. No, on the spot. New Testament baptism is just that. It's on the spot. No baptism class, no discipleship class, no confirmation class. No waiting on the spot. And there are a lot of you today, you came to church with no intention or clue whatsoever to be baptized, but this is the day. And it'll be that day that you'll never forget. And and so, look at these other examples quickly. Acts 8, 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe With all your heart, you may. See, there it is. Repent and believe. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded this chariot to stand still. Stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water. No sprinkling. And it says what? They baptized him and they came up out of the water. 
But it was immediate. It was immediate. Here's another one. Acts 16.30. What must I do to be saved? The answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And everybody said that word. Immediately he and all of his family were baptized. And so you see this example over and over again in Scripture. Now hear me. I don't want to be misunderstood. Salvation is in Jesus alone. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus communion. It's not Jesus plus religion. It's not Jesus plus morality. It's not Jesus plus good works. Did you hear that say amen? amen. Salvation is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And there's an example of that. Baptism can't save you. The thief on the cross repented, believed, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me. Today. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He wasn't baptized. But let's be honest. He didn't have an opportunity to be baptized. He would if he could. But he didn't have that opportunity. And you do have the opportunity, and you can. You know, I think about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It didn't make the Ethiopian eunuch a member of Philip's church. He was going back to Ethiopia. Baptism doesn't make you a member of the church. It makes you known as a member of Christ. You're one of his followers. And I tell you, just like he said, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Let me tell you, it was no accident that there was water on the side of the road that day. And there's there's no accident that there's water right here at every one of our campuses so you can be baptized today. Oh, I, I want you to understand here the importance here. Immediately, immediately it says. It says him and his household. There's some dads, there's some moms. You need to lead the way. Husbands and wives, you came from different religious backgrounds and and now you want to have a Christian home, a Christian marriage and now you have one church to call home. I've seen so many couples follow in baptism. And I told you, I, I got this when we renewed our vows. Now let me ask you a question. Does the Bible command that couples renew their vows? No. Is there anything in the Bible that forbids it? No. So people often ask me, they say, well, is it wrong for me to be baptized again? Listen, there's nothing in the Bible. In fact, if you look at it historically, I told you 300 years after the New Testament was written, the church started this infant baptism thing, and later there's a group called Anabaptist who were called the Rebaptizers, and that's us and groups like us that believe in believer's baptism. We were all called the Rebaptizers. So here's the bottom line. It's got to be your decision, not your parents. And here it is. It's a matter of those who repent and those who believe. And I think a lot of people who are rebaptized are those who made a decision as a child and then later as an adult you, you realize what it really meant to be saved and you repented and you believed and you wanted it to be your decision. I believe for a lot of people they made a decision as a child. They got so far away from God they don't even know if they were saved or not and they come back. And they say, I want to nail it down. And I want, my friends don't even know I'm a Christian. I want everybody to know that I am a follower of Christ. And so I, I liken it to renewal of vows. I, I don't think it's wrong if somebody f- feels like they need to be baptized again because baptism has no saving effect. It's identifying with Christ. I have to tell you two stories and I'll wrap it up. One of the most memorable baptisms, certainly in my 40 years, was a guy named Chris. It was our first church, Bowman Baptist, where I met my wife. And in that town, I was the youth pastor before I became the pastor. And I got all of the kids to play basketball and all the kids. Listen, we were close to Lake Hartwell and I love the water. And so I took them all skiing. And I told every one of them, every single one of them to ski, water ski, except Creo. And Creo couldn't ski. He, he lived over in the projects and he was weak. He didn't eat proper. He was always eat, eating a candy bar or drinking a soda. And, and he didn't have the energy or the strength to hold the ski straight. I never could teach him to ski. Every time we take off, he'd just do the split. You know, just do the split. But he got saved, and he got baptized. And, and the way it worked was you heated the water all Saturday and Sunday, and then Sunday night you had baptism. And, and so Sunday night we get up there and realize the heat and element had gone out. And that water's ice cold. And he goes to walk down, and, and it was just Creo. He tripped. He dove head first. Water went everywhere over the choir and everything. And, and so he's fighting. He can't swim. He got his hand on one glass, that glass, you know. Then he pulled his hand up to the next glass. <laughs> he took his elbows and threw over the glass. <laughs> and he said, God Almighty, this water's cold. 
And I mean, for 10 minutes, we couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> but after that, we really did baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, years later, I'm pastoring in Arkansas, and I get the call. And when he was 21, he was diagnosed with bone cancer. And he died. And I want you to know, Creo is with the Lord. And as big a blooper as his baptism was, hear me. He's not ashamed. He followed the Lord in baptism. Amen. Thank God for Creo. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. You're, hey, I need, I need a bag. Football season. Pass it. Throw it. I'm ready. Whoa. <laughs> Come on, give it up. Good pass. It was a better catch, but it was a good pass, okay? I just want you to know. I got it. I got it. Some of you say, well, I don't, I don't have a change of clothes, and uh, I can't be baptized today, but we got you covered. Everybody say, we got you covered. First of all, we, we got a shirt that says, meet the new me. And that's it. That's your shirt. And we got it in every size. We, we got children, adults. We got petite. We got 1X, 2X, 3X, 4X, 5X. All right, we got you covered. And then we got some drawers. Nobody's business has ever been in these drawers. And we got every size. We got you covered. Everybody say, we got you covered. Some of you, you spend a lot of money getting that hair done. And I mean, we got a Speedo cap that cover all the, the braids and the weaves and the locks and everything else. I want you to, I had the greatest compliment this week. One of our African-American families said to me, Pastor Grant, you really just a black preacher in white skin. I loved it. <laughs> Woo! It was awesome. We got you covered, all right? And I know some of y'all, you're saying, well, I don't have any family here. We got cameras at every baptismal pool so we can video it, give it to you, and you can put it on social media, give it to your family, show it to the whole world. You say, well... I'm afraid what people will think. I, I'm a teacher. I, I'm a deacon. I'm a staff member. Let me tell you, yesterday, everybody say yesterday. Yesterday on 21 Days of Prayer, one of our staff members who've been saved a long time got baptized and called and said, I want the family to know it. I think Miss Tammy's story is one of the most powerful I've ever personally seen. She was baptized as a child, got saved her senior year in high school. She never followed in believer's baptism. We marry, we get to our church in Arkansas, and we're having revival, and we're having baptisms, and she's working as a counselor in, in, in the baptistry area, and she's telling somebody why they need to have scriptural baptism after they got saved. And the Holy Spirit said, then why don't you do it? She walked out, and she said, you know I'm saved, I know I'm saved, but I've never had scriptural baptism, and I need for you to baptize me. And it was my joy to baptize my wife. Now, I want you to know, there, there are some days I feel like I didn't hold her down long enough. <laughs> but if the pastor's wife can get baptized, you can get baptized. You know, people say, well, I rode with somebody and they won't wait. Listen, if they won't wait on you, they need to get saved and baptized. Amen. <laughs> people say, well, I don't want to disappoint my, my parents. They had me christened or sprinkled. Listen to me carefully. You will be answering the prayer of your parent. That you would grow up and want to follow Jesus. And if they're in heaven, I promise you, they're cheering you on to be baptized today. People say, well, I don't want to get wet in public in front of all these people. Really? Jesus could hang before the world, shed his blood. But you don't want to get wet to let people know you belong to him. You say, well, I want the water to be clean. It is. It's got chlorine in it. My soul but hear me, I've been to the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized and it was muddy. You're no better than Jesus. People say, well, I hadn't prayed about it. Some things you don't have to pray about. The command's clear. I've told you what the Bible says. You just need to do it. Everybody say, just do it. And then people say, well, <clears throat> I've never been saved. Now, that is the only legitimate excuse is that you're lost. And I'm asking you to do something about that right now. Would you bow with me for prayer? The Bible says repent and believe, and that's what I'm asking you to do right where you are. Just simply say something like this, Jesus, I repent of my sins. 
I've sinned against God, against others, and against myself. And I believe, Jesus, you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross to pay for all my sins. I believe you were buried and rose on the third day. And I ask you to come live inside of me. I gladly, publicly say I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior. And today, I gladly follow in baptism for you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, come on, can we rejoice with those who prayed that prayer? And if you're at a campus, certainly we ask you to take the connection card. If you're online, you can text yes to 40371. But this is what some of you who live in the Hampton Roads area need to do. You need to right now throw on some clothes, get in the car, drive to the nearest Liberty campus, and be baptized today. I've seen it happen. And it may be that you are the one that needs to come right now. Get to one of our campuses, be baptized in one of our other services. You know, I want you to know the invitation is going to be different. I want everybody to stand. Everybody stand. Every campus, every location. Don't leave, go home, have lunch and say, I wish I'd done that. Don't get to the parking lot and say, man, I needed to have done that. And you have to turn around and come back in. Just do it. Just obey. And here's what I would tell you. In a moment, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask the life team to come that help us with baptism and campus pastors. When I call them, I want you to come. And I want some of you as members and believers to be sensitive to literally say to a friend or family member, if you want to go, I'll go with you. All right? On the count of one, we're going to have to ask somebody to let you out. Two, it's going to take faith. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Don't regret it. Leave here with no regrets. Everybody say, no regrets. Three, I want you to come. Campus pastors at every campus, those on the baptism team, ask somebody to let you out, and you come right now as I pray. I'm talking to somebody at Hampton, Harborview, Greenbrier, York River, Smithfield, Gloucester. I'm talking to somebody right now in the chapel, online. You come as I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as best I know how, I've answered the question of what is baptism and why you have asked your followers to do it. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work right now and impress upon people to come and to make a decision they'll be glad they made for all of eternity. I'm asking that, Lord, those who came as an unbeliever will leave a believer, a follower of Jesus. For those who came and they were baptized as an infant, Lord, let it be their decision today. Lord, I'm praying right now that you would move in such a way that heaven will rejoice and, Lord, will rejoice with them. So, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Make this message personal and this day memorable in Jesus' name. Amen.